Just how volatile is the South China Sea? With the Philippines and China engaging in open hostility on the water, is it just a matter of time before their standoff morphs into conflict? The U.S. has promised Manila protection, but would intervening bring the world too close to war? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the South China Sea. There are seven countries claiming rights to the resource-rich South China Sea. But China, using largely historical arguments, believes most of the water belongs to Beijing, even if just kilometers away from others' shores. Well, China has the most powerful military in the region, but the Philippines is backed by the equally powerful United States. The standoff has escalated to the point that Philippines President Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos says the potential for outright conflict is much higher than ever before. Here's a look. These scenes in the South China Sea are becoming more frequent. Confrontations between China and the Philippines have escalated in recent weeks. The Philippines accuses the Chinese Coast Guard of firing water cannons at a small ship carrying supplies to military personnel at the second Thomas Shoal. Manila also says Beijing installed floating barriers to close off entry to the island. But China claims these measures are legitimate against what it calls the forced intrusion of Philippine ships. China demands that the Philippines immediately cease infringements and provocation. If it persists, China will continue to take resolute measures to safeguard its territorial sovereignty and maritime rights. China claims large parts of the South China Sea, including the Spratly and Paracel Islands. But the Philippines says it violates maritime zones based on the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. China out of Philippine waters! A 2016 tribunal in The Hague ruled Beijing's territorial claims were not valid. Yet China has built military bases on the disputed islands, carried out naval patrols, and drilled for oil and gas to solidify its claims. This is not recognized by any country, any international body, certainly not by the Philippines. Our baselines have been well established for years now. Uh, we have uh, uh, the uh, uh, economic zone that uh, uh, China has already intruded upon. And until that premise that China has made in terms of all its discussions with the Philippines, then it's very difficult to see a way forward. And the sea is a lifeline for the region and beyond. 21% of global trade passes through the South China Sea. It's also believed to be rich in minerals and natural resources. And the livelihood of millions depend on fishing activities, with half of the world's fishing vessels operating in those waters. It is very painful because we work as fishermen so that our families can eat. Now that they are chasing us away, we cannot do anything. What should we do? The U.S. has also increased its military presence in the region to counter China. The Philippines' years-long pro-Beijing policy has shifted under President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Manila has restored its defense ties with Washington, giving the U.S. military access to new sites across the country. Our focus, our engagement, our commitment to the Indo-Pacific writ large and to the relationship, the alliance between the United States and the Philippines uh, in particular is um, more than, more than rock solid. It's an absolute priority for President Biden. While the historic dispute over the South China Sea is heating up, can the sides find a middle way, or is the region getting closer to a military conflict? Well, joining me now to debate where tensions really stand in the South China Sea and the risks of further escalation are from Manila. Jay Batong Bakal, an associate professor of law at the University of the Philippines and a former government legal advisor on maritime issues. From Beijing, Zhu Kindo, a fellow at the Pangawal Institution and former China Radio International Chief Correspondent. And from Washington, Patrick Cronin is Asia Pacific Security Chair at the Hudson Institute. Thanks all so much for being with me. You know, these tensions have really been on a pretty steady upward trajectory for some time now. And no side has really indicated where there's space for compromise. So, Jay, I'll start with you. Do you agree with President Marcos 
that the potential for outright conflict could actually just be a step away, if, even if just a simple mistake is made? Well, I tend to agree that the potential for conflict is uh, much closer at this point, uh, simply because of the way that uh, China has steadily escalated uh, its interactions uh, with the Philippines, especially in the past uh, year or so. Um, what we've seen is that while the Philippines has steadily deployed uh, four vessels uh, to this uh, derelict vessel attempting to resupply uh, and rotate personnel there, China has um, been increasing to now 40 vessels uh, or more than 40 vessels at, that, at the last incident. No? And it has also been much more forceful in its interactions, moving well beyond mere warnings to dangerous maneuvers, to using lasers and high-intensity water cannon. As several Philippine personnel have now been injured amidst the uh, destruction of a clearly unarmed and technically inferior vessel. It's a wooden vessel. Uh, so President Marcos announced that the Philippines will take proportionate, deliberate, and responsible response no? uh, with the help of the international community against these actions, which he has uh, called uh, illegal, coercive, uh, aggressive, and dangerous. Right, with the so help I of the uh, international uh, community, because the Philippines' military navy doesn't have much on China's. So how much is the Philippines fully dependent? You say it's the international community, but, but effectively it really is the United States that would have to come to the Philippines' side should it take on China over these issues. Well, it's, of course, uh, the expectation is high on the part of the United States uh, because we do have a mutual defense treaty with them. However, what we've seen uh, in the past year is that more and more nations uh, have been coming to the Philippines, uh, offering aid and assistance and uh, um, expressing support for the Philippine position uh, in these uh, disputes, especially when it comes to Second Thomas Shoal. So I think but that... Who would be uh, of most can, help? Uh, hmm? Which nation Sorry? would be of most help? other than the United States? Oh, well, of course, um, nations closer to the region would probably be um, the ones that uh, would be most dependable or most uh, dependent upon, uh, like Australia and Japan. And we do have other uh, nations that have been uh, coming and expressing um, uh, support. No? Uh, even if it's just moral support, it sort of strengthens uh, the hand, I believe, of the Philippines uh, when it comes to taking its positions uh, and making decisions with respect to these issues. Okay. Patrick, how much is the United States willing to do? Because it doesn't seem like China is, is looking necessarily to compromise on anything. It still claims this nine-point line. It's about 88% of the South China Sea, basically. And it is moving toward staking that claim uh, physically, actually. So where would the U.S. go? Well, China may be staking it physically, but it's not eager for war, especially not a conflict with the United States. And that's really the saving grace here. So the risk is growing, for sure, of tensions and possibly a local skirmish. But at the end of the day, uh, China, the United States, the Philippines, Japan, Australia, India, a lot of other countries are not really eager for a conflict directly over the South China Sea. But we are not going to back down. And we're not going to back down while our ally, President Marcos, uh, is trying to uphold international law, trying to uphold regional norms, uh, ASEAN norms, such as those enshrined in the Treaty of Amity and Cooperation against coercion. Um, I think we can do that. And Philippines is taking the lead. It's taking the lead through measured transparency to try to make sure the world and the region can see what's going on. And then by looking at a network of partners from Europe, uh, from South Asia, uh, from uh, Oceania, Northeast Asia, and from its neighbors in Southeast Asia, including Vietnam, to try to stand up to coercion. Um, China's interested in commerce, just like the rest of us. So they have um, conflicting objectives, just, just like all the countries here. Uh, and I think it's the balance of these uh, sort of objectives and goals that can keep the peace, despite the fact that we disagree over boundaries and over uh, maritime behavior. OK, so let me ask you, Kindo. Uh, China has said on numerous occasions it is not interested in going to war in the region because it is vital, uh, not just for the Chinese economy, but for the global economy, effectively. But still, China does seem to keep pushing the limits in its claims, and it, their, their claims are rather vast when it comes to the South China Sea, as we said, even just kilometers from the shores of other nations. So where does it stop? Where would China actually say, OK, this is where we will compromise with our neighbors, uh, this is why, where we'll recognize their uh, economic zones and stop here. 
That's a good point, uh, Andrea. Uh, let me say this, you know, these conflicts, uh, you know, these disputes rather, uh, are very complicated. Uh, you know, when China says uh, it has a historical background, I think you know, your, your viewers in particular uh, would be interested to know, you know, what's, what's going on and when uh, does it start, you know, those disputes. Uh, those nine dash line, uh, you know, precisely 11 dash line, uh, went back to 1948. Uh, remember, the current China, the People's Republic of China, uh, did not come into existence until October 1949. Then you would ask which Chinese government uh, drew those, uh, you know, nine dash line. That's the Republic of China, which now is in Taiwan. Uh, at that time, China was an ally of the United States. When China declared the nine dash line or 11 dash line to the UN uh, United Nations, and no countries, including neighboring countries, including the United States, said anything uh, opposite to that. So basically everybody, you know, nobody had any problem with the nine dash line or 11 dash line. So that's, uh, you know, the issue right now, you know, people say, you know, the, uh, the convention, uh, the UN convention on the law of the sea came into being in 1982. <laughs> so you see the, the contradiction here, right? Uh, the law would allow the countries to claim like 200 meters, for example, economic free zone, et cetera, continental shelf, et cetera. So yes, there are some contradictions. And, you know, the, when it comes to, uh, you know, sovereignty claim, we have to, you know, let it be. You know, Chinese claim this, you know, uh, to be theirs. The Philippines claim this to be theirs. It's really, you know, no solution probably. If we want to, if we want to solve this problem overnight. And I, you know, for me, I would say the only, pro the only solution is to shelve the disputes. Let's mm. lower the, the, the ask, you know, the, okay. the tension and work together. Well, uh, to co-develop this region. Work together. Okay, then let me come back to Patrick there, because uh, has the U.S. contradicted itself on an once recognizing, for example, China's claims and saying it's fair, and suddenly saying, well, the context has changed, so we're going to take this back now? Is that what's happened? Well, there are a couple of issues here, Andrea. One of them is that I think we can separate the issue over there are disputed borders. Uh, and then secondly, what's the behavior or what's the means of trying to settle disputes? Um, and clearly on the latter, China is violating regional norms and international norms and agreements over how to settle disputes. On the former issue, um, the circular reasoning, I would argue, applies to Beijing. Beijing basically cherry picks uh, international law by claiming that their historic rights, and this is largely a constructed history, it's not just a purely objective history, it's one that's disputed as well. But even putting that aside, China uses this circular reason to say, look, international law is meant to uphold national sovereignty. And we came into being in 1949, fair enough, the PRC established in 1949. But at the same time, you can't then uh, sign an international agreement uh, and say that, well, we're gonna put our historic rights into that agreement and only accept those things that we think are appropriate. So we'll deny the 2016 arbitral ruling that sided with the Philippines largely over the South China Sea. Um, and we're going to choose that low tide elevation features in that South China Sea area uh, suddenly is our domestic waters, therefore it doesn't apply to us, mm. uh, even though it applies under international law, or that we can draw straight baselines as, as though we are an archipelagic country like the Philippines, which we're not. So I think China is the one that's using some very uh, loose reasoning on this, even if yeah, all sides can be accused of doubles, you know, you know, double talk and, and various contradictions over time. Uh, I think the main problem here is China's driving up tensions and it's using the circular reasoning to justify it. Okay, uh, Zhu Kendo, I'll come back to you, but first I have to ask Jay, where, where where the Philippines has been going back, you know, to 1949, why, explain why the Philippines wasn't able to say at that time, wait a minute, these are our territorial waters, we need to stake a claim here now. How come, how come all the kind of other nations that now have these issues were, were overlooked at the time? Well, in the first place, uh, the nine dash line uh, map well, 11 dash line map was originally issued by Taiwan, was never really explained. No, the full content, the legal implications of this map were never really explained. The title of the original map simply says uh, map of South Sea Islands. No? So it seems to refer only to the islands, but not the waters there, which in 1947, when it was published, uh, were clearly beyond the scope of the areas that could be placed under national sovereignty by any nation. 
In 1949, uh, states' uh, rights to the sea were limited to only the territorial sea, which could extend to around three nautical miles for most states. But it was never agreed no, uh, at that mm. time what the maximum limit of that uh, could be. And therefore, there's no agreement uh, as, as well to any such uh, expansive claim. As late as 1999, Jigu Gao, who became a, a Chinese uh, judge at the ITLOS, published an article offering three possible explanations for China's claim in the South China Sea using that uh, nine-dash line map, which incidentally had not been officially uh, published uh, to the international community. It had been ma mainly a, uh, a publication within China and among, academic, uh, among academics. So it's never an official declaration in a way. Okay. That only came into being in 2009. No? So for the Philippines, uh, of course, it did not um, um, react uh, in 1947, aside from the fact that it was recovering from, from the war. Uh, there was nothing clear to react to at the time, other than a map. And we're not uh, going around just criticizing how states draw their maps. Okay. No? Uh, if it's just a matter of style, and if it, you can't even understand what it is that they're trying to represent. Okay, so Jukindo, we are where we are now. You've heard the the various arguments uh, that you know contrast with China's claims here. So, where do you see now the diplomatic opportunities to de-escalate this? And again, please say where China might be willing to compromise, because taking 88 percent isn't going to work out for China, according to the others who want their claims respected as well. Uh, as, as we said, there's a key word here, claim, you know, uh, the Philippines claim, the Chinese claim, you know, all the Vietnamese claim, the Malaysians claim. Uh, it's really about, uh, you know, national sovereignty claim. Uh, the good things like uh, we are not seeing, uh, say, a military uh, takeover of uh, whatever they claim. I think that's something probably we can take as comfort. And also, I want to stress one point, you know, uh, for the Chinese government, it's very hard for them to say, you know, you know what, we gave up the, these claims because they are close to the Philippines. Because the Chinese, the People's Republic, uh, Republic of China, the current the Ch Chinese government, they inherited these claims from the nationalist government, which is now in Taiwan. Uh, your viewers can actually, you know, take a closer look at the claim from Taiwan. They are almost identical. Uh, you know, uh, with the uh, the Beijing's claim here. Uh, so, you know, it's very difficult, as I said, you know, for the government to say, you know, we, we, we gave up this claim. Uh, but at the same time, the Chinese is not trying to take back those claims. You know, uh, many of those claims are under occupation by the Vietnamese or by the Philippines. So the Philippines, you know, took uh, eight uh, of those islands in 1970s. And in 1980s, they began to uh, basically build, uh, you know, airports or airstrip over there military post, outpost over there. In 1999, uh, you know, they parked this uh, old Navy ship uh, there. Uh, mm. You know, several, for several, actually several times, they promised to move away uh, these warships. Um, but, uh, you know, the Chinese government you know, do allow the supply, uh, let's say, on humanitarian uh, consideration, uh, supply of food and other supplies. But the problem is, you know, they uh, send the, you know, building materials basically with the purpose of building a permanent outpost, a military outpost likely there, and then it becomes part of the Philippines. So the Chinese government will do whatever it takes, except for, you know, military means to stop such action. That's what we are seeing now. We call it, you know, uh, quote unquote conflicts probably right now. Uh, so yes, I would agree, you know, the two sides should talk to each other. Let's bring back diplomacy. Let's bring back a discussion. The Chinese government has actually uh, made a proposal, several pr proposals to discuss, you know, to open high level discussions with the Philippine side, but they are not well received. Okay. There are basically no response from the Manila side. Okay. Uh, if I can, I'd like to come back to Patrick then, because uh, again, you know, we, we know the Philippines will need, they say the international community is probably primarily the U.S. military force. It, should this, you know, come to blows really with China, the U.S. administration has said it is an absolute priority for President Biden to protect the Philippines in this context. But to what extent would the U.S. really go? And what will happen if there is a regime change uh, in the U.S. And, and President Biden happens to leave? And we might get President Trump, for example, returning, who 
really wouldn't want to go to battle for anybody in that region because he seems to think it's just too far away to care about anyway. Well, on that last point, I would note that it was his former Secretary of State, uh, Mike Pompeo, who was the one who leaned forward about making sure that the Mutual Defense Treaty would apply to all Filipinos uh, in the South China Sea. Um, and so uh, it's not clear what uh, a second Trump administration would do. But I take your point, Andrea, that we don't know what any president would do in a crisis um, because uh, governments are going to seek uh, a reduction of escalation, if at all possible. But we're in a situation where there's spiraling uh, political will contest, where nobody wants to be the one to back down. And clearly, the Biden administration is given 100 percent support to uh, President Marcos Jr., um, because uh, we think that Marcos is on the right side of international law, on the right side of ASEAN norms, um, and is upholding sovereignty. It's not looking for conflict. You know, if I can just fight back or push back on the argument that, you know, China has to do this, um, it's, it's China that's shouldering ships and using water cannons. Those things are not about commerce and exports. Those are not about uh, things that are consistent with the Southeast Asian uh, norms. Those are in contradiction of, of even the coal regs, which are trying to avoid collisions at sea. And I think those kind of uh, misbehaviors essentially need to stop. Um, and then we can talk about uh, how do we solve claims, because yes, there needs to be direct bilateral diplomacy, there needs to be multilateral diplomacy, there needs to be an upholding of international law, and it's going to be multiple layers of diplomacy that ultimately resolves this problem. Jukindo, very quickly, if I can come back to you, because, you know, for an international audience that doesn't quite understand on the most basic level how China can say with whatever historical arguments it's making that it actually does have the right to the entire area of the South China Sea. There was one comparison I read that said that's the same reason the UK, for example, has a claim to the Falkland Islands that are much closer to Argentina, thousands and thousands of miles from, from the UK's mainland, but that historically that claim is there. They s kind of settled that area uh, and still have the right to it today, even though Argentina sees it very differently and was willing to go to all-out war for it. Does, is that it's, similar? It's not settled. It's not. Go ahead. It's not settled. So it's uh, it's kind of similar to this situation, unfortunately. Uh, you know, the, the, the only way, as I said uh, at the beginning, you know, I see as a possible solution that is, you know, because both sides claim, actually three sides, four sides probably claim uh, these uh, shore or the islands. You know, let's let's you know what? Let's not do anything about this island or this shore. Let's not build uh, a military outpost and then claim that's yours. And then you know, other claimants uh, will not accept that, and then there will be a problem. What about the all we step back? We can still maintain our claim. The Philippines can say this is ours. China can say this is ours. That's fine. You can continue to say it for the next one one hundred years, but let's not do anything on that. How about that? But the Philippines are trying, you know, by via this old Navy ship, which has been there for 20 years, more than 20 years, despite the promises to move it away. And they are trying to build a military outpost in that region under the name of uh, all uh, sending supply materials to the uh, crew, uh, to the Navy. So, you know, for the Chinese side, you know, another claimant, they have to do something to stop that kind of, uh, that, that kind of uh, you know, behavior because it is creating a fact which is not there uh, yet. Uh, mm. So, of course, that's not, not, accept, not accepted for the Chinese side, right? Okay, let me let Jay respond to that then. I mean, Jay, could the Philippines consider simply moving that ship that, you know, China feels was just put there because they're trying to make this false claim? Would that be in the cards? Well, I think at this point, uh, it, it, that would not be on the Philippines' um, favor, in Philippines' favor, because that would be considered as a defeat. Um, what people don't understand is that that ship was placed there in response to a Chinese incursion on Mischief Reef, which is only 25 nautical miles away, began in 1992 and then expanded in 1999. And so that expansion led to the grounding of the ship. Um, despite assurances on the part of China that it do not change the status quo, etc. No, in fact, in 2013, China released a video documentary um, um, produced by the CCTV, uh, celebrating the fact that it was a covert operation uh, intended to strike deep uh, into uh, the Southeast Asians' uh, um, um, claims. No, so. 
for us to withdraw the ship would essentially be to bow down to Chinese demands. And that would mean bowing down to these pure exercises of power on an area which is uh, under international law, rightfully ours. Uh, um, and but the may, may I, may that ship, may establishment I jump of that, in? Uh, you know, that's, that's your is, promise. Uh, you know, promise right made by governments yes. after governments, but you failed to do so. Oh, interesting. That's your government yes. promise to move that ship away by several governments, the, the, and you failed to do so. Now, the fact that it is a grounded ship is immaterial because the right is with us. Okay. Now, China has been erasing this alleged promise without proof. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt uh, because we are completely out of time and it seems that there's little scope for real agreement here as everyone still seems to be on completely uh, different pages as to the history and the contemporary issues uh, posed by the South China Sea. But that's all the time we have for now. So I'd like to thank all three of my panelists really so much for being with us on this edition of the Newsmakers. Our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.